Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brian, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'd like to congratulate everybody for being, for being sober today. And I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me and be able to see some old friends. I come from New York, on the east side, in an area called Yorkville. I don't remember the first time I picked up a drink, but I do remember the first time I had a blackout. Somehow, looking back over my life, I seem to be able to remember more things about growing up as a boy than I can most things as a man. I can remember with pinpoint accuracy the first time I had a blackout. I was 13 years old, had some money in my paper, in my pockets from hustling papers in the saloons the night before, and I went and a friend of mine, Johnny and I, we went to 97th Street between Lexington and Park Avenue, and there was an old vacant abandoned building there, and it was a wino camp. I remember, and these uh, winos, they were all the, the soldiers and sailors and the marines and merchant seamen and wax and waves and bams. These were the drunks of the Second World War. And uh, I walked in there, and there was one guy laying there. I gave him a shake, and he got up, and I gave him the high sign to come out and uh, make the run. Now, some of you may have maybe remember Jeannie. Jeannie was... One of the the winos in the neighborhood. I just wanted to mention his name, and he was one of the winos in that in that building when I went in that time. And the guy came out, and I can remember this guy as one of the most handsomest men I had ever seen. He stood about six foot two. He had jet black curly hair, big blue eyes. The most he could have been was anyway in his twenty five to thirty years old. And he was an old, old, young, dirty man. He was a wino. Now, I come from a work ethnic background, and the only requirement for becoming a man was a desire to work. As long as you worked, you could beat the wife, beat the kids, beat the system, you could beat anything you want, as long as you worked. And the winos broke the carnal rule that didn't work, so they were ostracized at these vacant buildings, and down around the ballpark, and down along the East River on the park benches. And the guy made a, I gave him enough money to get us three bottles of Sneaky Pete. That was five-star Muscatel in those days. It was about 26 cents a bite. He made the run, and he came back, and he got his bottle, and he shuffled in the building. And Johnny and I went behind the, the building to the vacant lots, and I cracked my pint, and Johnny cracked his pint. And we started drinking a wine, and we're laughing and giggling and body punching each other. We knocked off the two pints. I remember going around, walking up to get the wine to go make the run again. I remember walking up, bumping into the people, pushing the people aside. I was about this big. That was my first experience with beer muscles. I'm pushing this here guy. And he made the run. And I remember it was about 2 o'clock Saturday afternoon when I cracked that second pint. And I had it to my mouth. I can remember it like I'm looking at this this microphone. The next thing I knew, I come out of a blackout. My mother had my head over the kitchen tubs. I was throwing up all the wine in the tubs. My two brothers were leaning over, beating the hell out of me, screaming at me. Where had I been all day? Because the neighbors come in and told my mother that son Brian is drunk and he's staggering all over the neighborhood. And my mother was out and the neighbors were out and he scoured the neighborhood. And they didn't find me till about 11 o'clock at night. And I just couldn't tell them where I had been. It was 2 o'clock in the afternoon when I cracked that second pint. And here it was at 11 o'clock at night. And I heard the winos talking about pulling a blank. And this was the first time I ever pulled a blank, as I know now, a blackout. And there was something exciting about it. There was something manly about it, like a Viking. One minute you're here, next minute you're in it. You know, you don't know where you're at. You're fighting, next minute you're back. There was just something mysterious and and manly about it. And a couple of days later, I'm walking up the neighborhood. One of these big guys come walking down. I uh, shine shoes in the saloon. And uh, I was thinking about this blank. So I stopped him. I remember looking up at him. He's looking down. He had his hands in his hips, smiling, listening to me. And I'm explaining what had happened. And he turned around when I was finished. He said to me, kid, were you drinking? I said, yeah, I was drinking. He said, were you drunk? And I said, yeah, I was drunk. And he just leaned back and he shrugged. He gave me this big shrug, tossing my hair, walked around me, kept walking. Never said a thing. 
It seems like I have been born and raised what I would call this alcoholic shrug. I've seen it all my life. I walk in a bar, there wouldn't be a soul in a bar. And they say, where the hell is everybody? They say, yeah, they're out looking for Joe's car. He doesn't know where we parked it last night. They be going up and down looking for the car. Somebody say, was Joe drinking last night? And they say, yeah. Was Joe drunk last night? And they say, yeah. They just shrugged, went about their business, didn't say anything. I walk in a bar, they say, Mary's on the phone. She's hysterical. She doesn't know where she left the children. Somebody say, is Mary drinking? They say, yeah. Is Mary drunk? They say, yeah. And they just shrugged. They never said anything, just shrugged and went about their business. Now, when I was 14, you had to be 16 to get in the pool room. And that's where the action took place. That's where the big guys hung out. So I broke into the church directory. I robbed a pair of baptismal papers along with the church seal. I forged my, the papers, made myself 16. I sold off the rest with the seal. And at 16, you had to be 18 to get your seamless papers without your, your, your parents' consent. So using the phony papers, I got my seamless papers, and I just turned 17, I ran away and I went to sea. And no matter where I traveled in the world, the shrug followed me. <laughs> I mean, it was like some kind of international voodoo. I mean, it was like juju. No matter where I went. I remember my first trip, I'm in Singapore, I'm in a nightclub, and a fight broke out. And I got into the fight, and I got all cut up and beat up. They took me to the hospital where they stitched me up, and then they had me in the tank. For three days, and when they took me out of the uh, out of the uh, the tank and they put me in the dock, and I looked like one of these punk rockers. Hair, but the head was shaved and stitched up, and the rest was all pointed with, the, and it was all black. And in those days, Singapore was still a British crown colony. And sitting up there was a British magistrate with a white curly wig on, a long black flowing robe, and representing me was the American consulate. And I remember the magistrate leaning over, saying to the American consulate. He says, was that bloke drinking? And the American counsel leans over to me and he said, were you drinking? And I leaned over and I looked at the American counsel and said, eyeball to eyeball, one American to another. And I said, was I drinking? I said, of course I was drinking. You don't think I look like this sober, do you? <laughs> I said, what the hell kind of an American do you think I am anyway? I said, of course I was drinking. I was drunk, they were drunk, everybody was drunk. And he looked up and he said to the magistrate, Yes, your magistrate, the bloke was drinking. And the judge leaned back, he went like this here. <laughs> the American counsel went like that, the captain stood up, he went like that. I looked around, I went like that. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, that's my story in a nutshell. It was just one shrug after another. That's where alcohol took me. It reduced me and my life to a human shrug. They said the ship sailed for Panama last night. Was Brian aboard? <laughs> the ship came back from Panama. Was Brian aboard? Is Brian still in jail? Did he get out? Did he go home last night? Whatever happened to that nice girl he was going with? Ladies and gentlemen, where is Brian? That's the story of my life. In 1969, I was on a real bad drunk. A real wicked drunk. And I come out of a blackout, and I had a phone in my hand. I'm weaving back and forth. The tears are running down my eye. I'm talking to this voice at the other end of the phone. And the voice is saying, take it easy, Brian, take it easy. Give us your address, and I'll send a couple of men over to talk to you. And I couldn't figure out who this guy was. And who is he? he? wants to send a couple of men over to talk to me. Finally, I, I kept throwing out words, hoping maybe I could fill in and figure out who he was. Finally, I asked him, I said, what do you mean send a couple of men over to talk to me? I said, who the hell are you? He says, I'm so-and-so from Intergroup. Now, if you've never heard the word Intergroup before, you have to admit it sounds like some kind of communist word. <laughs> I said, Intergroup? What the hell are you talking about? Who are you? He says, I'm, I'm, I'm so-and-so from Intergroup, Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, Intergroup, Alcoholics Anonymous? I said, how the hell did you get my number? <laughs> he said, you just called us up. I said, I call you up. What the hell would I call you up for? He said, look, Brian, take it easy. Give it your... I said, you hold it right there, mister. You want something? I'll give you something. I'll give you a punch in the mouth. That's what I... And I hung up the phone, and I sat down in the bed, and the sweat started pouring off me. My mind kept racing back and forth, trying to figure out what in God's name did I do this time that Intergroup would be after me. <laughs> I mean, the only thing I knew about Intergroup was the old Second World War spy movies, Humphrey Bogart and Jimmy Cagney and Battle Brian. And in those movies, when Intergroup was after, it meant one thing. You know? 
So I put the light out. I sat there quiet. I got up, you know, I peeked out the keyhole thinking maybe there's a guy. I went over and I pulled the curtain back. I searched out the doorways across the street thinking maybe I see a little guy there looking up, you know. In 1970, in 1970, I'm on a wheel. I mean, this was a wicked drunk. This was a, this, this was a mean drunk I was on. And I come out of a blackout. I'm talking to this guy on the phone again. But this time he told me where the, where the meeting was. And the meeting was the old Butterfield group in 72nd Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. And I went. And the only thing I heard at that meeting was stay out of one bar, one bar at a time. Stay out of one bar, one. Now, I'm sure what the guy would say was stay away from one drink, one drink at a time. But I heard stay out of one bar, one bar at a time. And I left, I walked up to 72nd Street, and I walked all the way from 72nd Street to 93rd Street. Walking straight up, there was beer gardens to the right, and saloons, and cafes, and, you know. But I kept walking up, and I got up to 93rd Street. In the saloon that I drank, and I walked in there, I'm standing up, and I ordered up a sobering up drink, which was club soda with a twist of lemon. And I'm standing at the bar, and all of a sudden I felt my body, and boom, I went into a fit. And when I come out of it, they had an ambulance there, and they had a guy was, I was in an ambulance, and this big guy kneeling the top of me, he got something in my mouth, and I could hear the sirens going, and a friend of mine, Jackie, was there, and the guy's, put, I didn't know where the hell I was, I grabbed the guy, saw wrestling with him, I got on top of him, I started punching the shit out of him, he screamed to stop the, stop the ambulance, the ambulance came through a screeching hole, the guy come around, opened the door, I jumped out, he gave me a kick and a push, I hit the ground, I took off like a shot, Jackie ran over, he gave him a stomp, he jumped down, he ran after me, I'm running up here, Jackie's chasing me, I run down here, Jack and I spot a bar, I go running in the bar, I'm huffing and puffing in the bar, Jackie comes running in, he's huffing and puffing, I said, Jackie, what happened, God damn it, what happened, what was all that about, he says, I don't know, <laughs> he says, you come in the bar, you're all right, next thing you're flopping all over, some kind of fit. Now, the only thing I could attribute that fit to was his intergroup anonymous with stuff, you know. They told me to stay out of one bar, one bar at a time. I passed all those bars. Nothing happened to me. I go in one stinking bar, and I woke up in an ambulance. I remember saying with awe, saying to Jackie, Jesus, no wonder those people are anonymous. I mean, they could kill you in broad daylight and never leave a fingerprint. I said, that's it with this intergroup anonymous stuff, Jack. They had one crack at me, and they goddamn near killed me. In 1969, I was, in 1971, I'm a retired sand hog. And for those of you who don't know what the sand hog is, where the compressed air workers here in New York, the miners, where the ones that do the, the mining, the build the tunnels and the subways and and I was on this drunk. This was a nasty drunk I was on. Two weeks now, it was a nasty. And I passed out and I was banging at the door. Open up the door, Brian. Open up the door. Kicking in. I was the, uh, the shop store, the union shop store. I opened up the door and he came in. He said, Jesus, man, this place stinks. Ooh. And he pulled back the grapes and he put up the thing. And he said, man, what the hell are you doing? I looked around. There was bottles and puke and cigarettes all over the place. I had to agree with him. It was the first time I saw it in two weeks. I looked around and he's a mess. He said, what the hell are you doing, Brian? I said, what are you talking about? I said, keep your voice on. You let the neighbors know my business. What the hell's the matter, you know? He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm having a couple of drinks. He said, how long do you think you're having a couple of drinks? There was something in his tone of voice. I knew I was in trouble. I said, I don't know, a week or two. He said, you've been on this drunk six weeks. He said, we can't keep covering your job. I was the dynamiter on the job. He says, why the hell are you coming back to work? I said, what's today? He said, Wednesday. I said, all right, I'll be back Monday. He said, I, I said, look, man, I'm tell you, I'll be back Monday. Because all I ever needed most of my life was three days. Three days, and all I ever needed was silence, a floor, water, and toilet. That's all. And you go through the whips and the jingles and the horrors and the shakes and the, the runs. And usually it took about three days to get the badness out. And when I get all the badness out, I always felt pretty good. And I went back to work Monday. And they call for the dynamite. I load three on sticks of dynamite. I drop down the tunnel level. We go in. They start loading the dynamite. And I go into a convulsion. And they turn around and say, what the hell is going on? All the lights are out. What's going on? I don't know. It's Brian. Where was he? He's over there. I know he's over there. Watch out. You're standing on him. I'm flopping all over the dynamite, pulling the gaps out. <coughs> they had a call. They got an ambulance. I'm coming out. And I got in a lot of trouble. And they're claiming I was an epileptic. And they didn't want me working around any machinery in the tunnel. And least of all, the dynamite. They didn't want me around the dynamite. So I had to go to Lenox Hill Hospital. 
I had to go to Atlantic Hill Hospital for a series of uh, epilepsy tests, and I went and I took all the tests. And a couple of days later, I'm sitting outside the neurosurgeon's office, and he sticks his head out. He said, Mr. Meinsen, I said, here, give me the height, sir. And just before I walked into his office, I stopped and I took this big, deep breath. And I walked in, he's shuffling around the charts. He said, well, Mr. Mines, everything here looks pretty negative. And I heard the word negative. And I let my breath out just a little bit. I said, what do you mean negative, doctor? He said, well, everything here looks pretty good. And I let my breath out a little bit more. I said, you mean to say, doctor, I'm not an epileptic? He said, nah, you're not an epileptic, you're an alcoholic. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, you know, you know what I mean, you know. He's like he's trying to skirt the issue. I said, but I was, I'm not an epileptic, right? He said, no. I said, then I didn't have an epileptic fit in the tunnel. He said, no, you had an alcoholic seizure. I said, oh, thank God. Thank God. I gave him a big hug. I mean, what the hell did I care about being an alcoholic? As far as I was concerned, any man worked the salt was an alcoholic. You see, the key was that I wasn't an epileptic. They're the ones that will get you fired. So I didn't put it on paper. I went back, I saw the safety and the engineer, I drew it on the desk, I said, here, I'm an alky, not an epi. <laughs> here it is, right here, alcoholic. He said, oh, so you're an alcoholic, Brian. I said, yeah, he said, so am I. I said, no kidding. He said, you're going back to work? I said, yeah. He said, you want a drink? I said, sure. Close the door, pull out the bottle, start sucking on the bottle. They called for the dynamite and going down with the dynamite, and life was good. I mean, life was good. I had my job back now, and they couldn't fire me. I'm only an alky. You know, I mean, life was good. But a friend of mine, Joe, Joe and I were born and raised together and went to sea together. And now we're working the tunnels together. And Joe had been in AE for about seven years. And he had been 12-stepping me, always trying to get me to go to a meeting. And he had heard about the trouble I was in, so he came up to the house. And he said, Brian, why don't you come to an AA meeting with me? And this time I agreed. And the reason I agreed is because I couldn't seem to beat these convulsions. I was convulsing on subway platforms in the middle of the streets, and now I'm convulsing on the job, and I'm in a lot of trouble, and I agreed to go. And at that meeting, the man stood up there, and he guaranteed that if you don't pick up the first drink, you can't get drunk. He guaranteed that it's impossible to get drunk if you don't pick up the first drink. And as the meeting ended, I made a beeline for the stairs to get out of there. Everybody stopped. And they started to say to our father. And I spun around. I was shocked. And then I searched out the crowd. And there was my friend Joe. He had his eyes down, holding his two fingers, rocking back and forth, singing the Our Father. And I looked at him. I said to myself, Ah, oh, Joe, what the hell did they do to you, Joe? <laughs> I mean, here was a man from York where we went to see. And here he is now, rocking to Jesus and Psalm singing with the best of them. Well, anyway, we went for coffee after we were sitting at a restaurant. Everybody from AA come in. They start filling in. And I leaned over. I said to him, I said, Joe, how long are you in AA? He said, seven years. I said, Joe, now this is just you and me now. You and I go back to since we're kids. I said, did you understand that man back there when he said it was impossible not to get drunk if you don't pick up the first drink? Joe said, yeah, yeah, I understood it. I said, Joe, Joe, just stop and think. Deep down in the cabins of your bowels, do you understand that it's impossible not to get drunk if you don't pick up the first drink? Joe said, I understand. What the hell are you trying to say? I said, Joe, what I'm trying to say is my first meeting, and I understand it. Of course you can't get drunk if you don't pick up the first drink. Can't you see, Joe, you're being bullshitted, man? You're throwing good money in the basket full of happy horseshit. That's all hokey pokey, smoke and mirrors. Now you see it, now you don't. Now you drink it, now you're not. Where did it go? <laughs> hokey pokey, Joe. Joe said, Brian, please, please, push the meeting book to me. He said, please, Brian, here. Why don't you try 90 days, 90 meetings? And I pushed the meeting book back. And I said, Joe, maybe you don't mind sitting there in the front row, humped over, squinting up at the speaker, sucking on your lips for sobriety like you're some kind of AA Quasimodo. I said, Joe, I'm not Quasimodo, man. That's not my style. Sucking around people is in my style. He said, Brian, please. I said, look, Joe, please. I'm telling you right now as your buddy, you keep hanging around with the people over there, and you're going to be here for another seven years. I'm telling you, Joe. <laughs> Just then the bells from the church start ringing. I broke out laughing. I said, Joe, you better get back to the tower. Somebody took your job. 
that was that was in the fall of 1971. And I went through all the holidays, all the holidays, 71 into 72, never picking up a drink. Now, I live in, I'm born and raised in Yorkland. I'm living on 86th Street, and that's where the St. Patrick's Day play breaks up. And that's where generations of generations of Yorkalites, we all come in from 3rd Avenue to Park Avenue, both sides. It's like a huge neighborhood reunion. And my two nieces came in from Westchester. I hadn't had a drink now in about four months. And I remember walking up, and I had a, a Russian cassock hat on with sprigs of shamrocks, and I had a big green tie and a camel hair coat, and my niece on one arm and my niece on the other. And I'm walking up, and everybody's waving to Brian, and I'm sitting there, and they had all this here. And I got up to where my crowd is drinking, they're passing around a bottle, and a bottle come to me. I saw sucking on a bottle. And this first drink this time put me in the grip of the grape for two weeks. For two weeks I was in the grip of the grape. And the drunk this time was so horrendous that the fears were so great. I had the doors locked, the windows locked, the shades drawn, the phone off the hook. For two weeks I was totally isolated. The only phone call I made was a liquor store, had the booze delivered. And for two weeks I was totally isolated. And only an alcoholic would understand I loved it. God, I loved it. I mean, nobody could bother me, no no judgment. I was standing there in the middle of the room with my head up, my shoulders squared away, that wind gently tussling my hair, my eyes squinting with mirth, searching out the horizon, my teeth bared with lust, my chest slowly heaving, my hands opening and closing. I was standing there truly a man amongst men, a man of destiny, all things to women. Jackie and Nassas would be on the ground with her arms around my knees saying, I love you, Brian. I love you. Please take the money. Take the money. And I'd throw my head back and I'd laugh and say, money? You can't buy a man like me with money. And they pick him up by the scuff of their neck and i throw out the door. Next minute to be banging at the door, I'd open it up and be Sophia Lauren. She said, I heard about you, Brian. Please, just one time. <laughs> <laughs> And I'd throw her out and I'd slam the door. And I'd yell through the door, why don't you goddamn women leave me alone? Can't you see I'm only human? Leave me alone, goddamn it. I would stand in the middle of the room huffing and puffing, huffing and puffing, because I had just knocked out Muhammad Ali for the heavyweight championship of the world. And I would always knock him out March 16th, so they would beg me to leave the St. Patrick's Day Parade. <laughs> And leave it, I would, and I'd be coming down Fifth Avenue and screening, and all of a sudden hitting 86th Street, and all of the marchers to be standing in one place, waiting for Brian, the champion of the world, to be in place. And right when I was in place, the mayor would get the high sign, the stick would come down, and the bagpipes, and the screaming, and the yelling, and the cops would be on the horses, skittering all over the place, and the cops on the ground with their arms locked trying to hold back the surging crowd of women. And they'd all be yelling, there's Brian, there, let me see him, there he, oh my God, that's him, that's Brian. And every now and then I'd hear a cop say, what a man, what a man. <laughs> I'd be standing, I'd be standing in the middle of the room, weaving back and forth, weaving back and forth, holding up this bottle, and the tears would be running down my cheeks, and the hair would be wild and matted from two weeks of drunk and a and big bubbly snot coming out of my mouth and a red grimacing mouth and a t-shirt with everything I puked and heaved all over the t-shirt and these shorts, I mean, barely hanging on my hips, these warm, wrinkled, faithful, farty, pair of shorts and my, my toes caked with black, dried, smelly sweat and I'd be weaving back and forth with these tears of love pouring down my cheeks because it was the third year in a row that I had won the Academy Award. <laughs> well, April 1st, April Fool's Day, 1972, Intergroup finally came and got me. <laughs> and they caught me off to a detox, to a Freeport Hospital for a five-day detox. And uh, I remember they were taking me down to drunk section. And my brother-in-law had one arm, and the nurse had the other arm, and the hair was wild and matted with that sweat, and the two-week growth, the vomity, dribbly T-shirt. And naturally, those warm, wrinkled, faithful, farty pair of shorts. I mean, they went with me from the beginning to the end. If I staggered down the street and fell in the gutter, they fell in the gutter. If I got locked up for the weekend, they were locked up for the weekend. Mark my words, ladies and gentlemen, one day shorts like that will be holding their own meetings. <laughs> 
and God knows they deserve them. <laughs> and as it would take me down, right opposite there was the men's, uh, the, the men's lounge, which was a nurse's station. And as it would take me down, this guy stepped out and he saw the three of us coming down. And he stepped in, I could hear him say, hey guys, come out and take a look at this guy, real wolf man. Take a look at this guy. And they all come out and they're laughing. They're going, oh, don't touch him, nurse, you get locked your, your fingers will rattle off a day at a time. And they're all laughing and joking. Now, this is the first time in my life I ever, ever had a man or a woman laugh at me right to my face, and I couldn't do anything about it. I remember my head was down, and I heard them, and I heard this soul-sickening voice, this voice that had tortured me ever since I was a child, yelling at me, do something, look at them laughing at you. You've been nothing but a disgrace all your life. Can't you ever do anything right? Get your face up. Don't let them laugh at you. Get your, be a man, God damn it. For once in your life, try to do something right. And I tried to get my head up, and I just couldn't get my head up. It seems like somebody used a machete and cut up all my neck muscles and my back muscles. I just couldn't get my head up. And if there's one thing at that moment I wish I could have done, and that was to grab myself by the head of the hair and spit right in my face. That's how I felt. I just turned 38 uh, years old two days before that, and I was physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, and sexually bankrupt. I see in sobriety that I had a a problem with impotency since I was about 28 years old. And it was tough sexually faking it over the years. I was a sand hog and I was a merchant seaman and I was a bartender and I'd be working the bar and the guys would be standing there and they'd be talking about the girls. And this guy took the girl home and he made love two or three times last night. The guy over there, he took the girl home. He made love two or three times. And this guy, he went home and he made love two or three times. Well, I see you now in sobriety that if these guys are taking these girls home, making love two or three times a night, one thing is for sure, they didn't drink what I was drinking, that's for sure. You don't drink that shit and go home and make love two or three times. You go home and fall out of the bed two or three times. The closest they're coming to sex that night is when they pee pee two or three times. Now, I don't want to believe it as sex thing. I don't want to get into that and believe it as sex thing. But the only reason I'm throwing it out there is because maybe, Maybe there's some guy out there that kind of knows what I'm talking about. As for the women, they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I've been there five days, 90 days, 90 meetings, 90 days, 90 meetings, get a meeting, book, get up front, get up front, get a sponsor. Joe was waiting for me when I come out. I'd be sitting there in the front row and right after the meeting, I'd buttonhole one of the old timers. And I say, look, just between me, you, you and me, nothing to do with these people here. Where did you get this 90 days, 90 meetings stuff? Where did you get 90 days, 90 meetings? How come not 85 days and 85 meetings? Or 70 meetings and 70? How come? And not, none of them knew. None of the old timers knew. Not only didn't they know, but they couldn't care less. They said, look, Brian, that's no first hard AA rule. We don't pick up one drink one day at a time. We're about not drinking one day at a time. But 90 days, 90 meetings for you is not a bad suggestion. Maybe it give you a little time to get rid of some of that anger. But I had to find out where they got 90 days, 90 meetings, because I was not about to make the same mistake twice. I remember when I was a kid in school, I was always being beaten and punished and kept at the school over these mystical, esoteric numbers. I remember there was the 12 apostles and the Ten Commandments and the 12 lost tribes of Israel and the seven deadly sins and the eight wonders of the world and the nine planets and the four winds and the seven seas. And Moses was in the desert for 40 years and Columbus was on the Atlantic for 40 days, 40 nights. And now me, 90 days, 90 meetings. <laughs> but it didn't take me long to figure it out. And I finally came to the conclusion that you have to be here 90 days, 90 meetings just to understand what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> There's a very sophisticated language that takes place here. The topic would be, you see, when you made this decision not to make a decision, you made your decision. And, oh, what a topic, man. <laughs> you see, by not taking an action, you have taken an action, you know. And the one that got me was, you see, you can't keep it unless you give it away. In fact, you have to give it away to keep it. And the more you give, the more you get. I say to Joe, Joe, what the hell are they giving away? <laughs> they don't work. They're all unemployed or welfare. Joe, they're even an alimony. Can't you see? And he say, see what? I said, can't you see we're being bullshitted, man? 
He say, my God, are you still in that kick? And he get his coffee and his cigarettes, and he go stand somebody else. And he'd walk away. I'd say to myself, get run. Run, you stinking A-A-S kisser. I mean, that's all they seem to do around here. Stay away from a drink. Come to meetings and kiss ass. I said, let me tell you, Joe, it'll be a cold wind blown to hell the day they get a man like me to bend over and start kissing ass. <laughs> but I kept coming to the meetings, and it seems like the first 90 days, I, I ran into these speakers, and it seems like I kept running into the same speakers. And I had nicknames for the speakers. There's Easy, does it, Tom. One day at a time, Joan. First things first, Molly. Not all these nicknames, and his speaker gets up there, and his name is Charlie. Charlie stood up there, and he said, I picked up a drink. I fell on the flight of stairs, and I surrendered. And they all started to applaud, hug him, kiss him, get his order, grab him, bind the parties. <laughs> I was stunned. He picked up a drink, fell on the flight of stairs, and surrendered. Man, I fell off gangways, bar stools, garbage cans, and never in a million years would I ever tell a shit story like that in public. I mean, he stood up there and told that right in front of the girls. I said, man, he'll never get a girlfriend with a story like that. He'd be better off saying he fell up the stairs. I nicknamed him Staircase Charlie. And a week later, they introduced Charlie again. I said, oh, there's Staircase. And I sat down, and I zeroed in on every word that this man had to say, because it was important to me to find out what kind of a stairs it was that made him surrender. Now, maybe if he says he picked up a drink and fell down a four-story spiral staircase, all right, I'll go on. Right. Well, maybe he's going to say he picked up a drink and went five stories between the banners and say, you got to give him that one, you know. But somehow the way he was dressed and the way he talked, and in my heart, I knew this guy was strictly a two-step foyer job. And he went into a story. <laughs> He went into a story and he said, I picked up a drink, I fell on a flight of stairs, and I surrendered. You know, and this time I heard a little bit different. I heard a little bit different. And about a week later, he introduced Charlie again. And Charlie got up there, and he went into a story. As he got closer to picking up that first drink, he felt my stomach tighten up. I said, uh-oh. Hey, Charlie, watch that drink there, Charlie. Watch the drink. And Charlie got closer to the drink. I said, Charlie, can't you see what you're doing? Watch the drink. And Charlie said, and I picked up a drink, and I shrugged and said, ah, well, there goes Charlie. I mean, once Charlie picked up that drink, in my heart of hearts, I knew no way in hell could he beat the staircase. It was the first time in my life I understood the dynamics of the first drink. I understood he had absolutely no protection whatsoever for that against that first drink. I understood. I'm not talking about knowing. I knew since I was a kid that it was the first drink. I knew it, but I never understood it. I knew I was an alcoholic, but I didn't understand it. Knowing and understanding is two entirely different things. You may know one plus one equals two, but if you don't understand it, you never get the drink. And it was the first time I understood it. And the meeting started to open up to me. And I was involved right then. And I was about three months sober. And the only meetings I made was beginners meetings and open meetings. I stayed away from book meetings and step meetings because of the concept of God. I'd walked away from the God, the, uh, from the church that I was raised in at 14, and nobody, especially the AA, was going to start ramming God down my throat. But I happened to be at a meeting when I went into the concept of God. And one said it was this, another said it was that, and I remember this man raising his hand saying, the way I had heard God was G-O-D, good orderly direction. When I heard that good orderly direction, ladies and gentlemen, it seems like a, my chest split open and centuries of venom and stink and anger and confusion poured out. Here now was a God that I could understand, good orderly direction. As far as I was concerned, that's what God was supposed to have been all along, was good orderly direction. But where I came from and how I was raised, I just couldn't buy it. And I literally made up my mind right then and to turn my will in my life over to care of good orderly direction, which was you, yay. Hey, hey. And the only thing you were asking me was to try to stay away from a drink, Brian, and try to do the best you can, try to get to a meeting. 
and everything became good all the direction. I go up to the job, I see the guys drunk, fighting, getting fired. I walk down the street, I see some old young dirty man on the corner panhandling, trying to get enough to get a drink. I see a guy drag a woman out of a cab, I had have that drag her back in the bar because he hadn't finished drinking yet. And I say, there, but for the grace of good orderly direction goes I. And it simply made sense because I no longer did any of those things. Because I trusted in you. I didn't pick up the first drink. I kept coming to the meetings. And I was working up in Dan Cortland Park with the Dynamite for about a year. And I was working nights. And I was right in 86 we had a nightclub Bonnie Googles. And outside of it was a park bench. And I used to get up there in the after, early after, in the morning. And I'd get my coffee. And that because it took me about an hour and a half to get to work. And I'd sit there and I'd have a few cigarettes and get myself together. And then I could make the trip. And this day I'm sitting there. And coming up was this lady with this little kid, this little baby. And she looked like a little Shirley Temple, little dimpled knees and, and, and ringlets in her hair. And she spotted me. And I got the coffee in one hand and a cigarette. And she comes running up and she jumps right up in my lap. And she got this big lollipop right up in my lap. And, there, and she's pushing a lollipop in there. And I'm looking at the kid. And the mother comes up and she looks down. She says, I guess she, want, she wants you to lick a lollipop. And I look and I put the lollipop in my mouth and I made a big fuss. I gave it to the kid. The kid jumped off, popped it in her mouth. And she started skipping up the street. And the mother leaned down to me. And she nodded. I nodded the mother. And I'm watching the two walk away. And as I watch him walk away, this tremendous feeling of well-being, this tremendous feeling of love, nearly picked me off the bench. And I kept saying, this is good all the direction. This is good orderly direction because I had never experienced something like that. Good or- I couldn't put a word to it. This is good orderly direction. And I heard a voice of an enemy saying, Nah, Brian, this is not good orderly direction. This is the God, the God of the rooms. This is the God of sobriety, the God they've been talking about. And I was just amazed that, that, that God would come to me. I'm sitting there with a coffee and a cigarette and sand hogging. And, and God would come to me with a taste of kids' lollipop in my mouth. And I was just overwhelmed. And I said, God, God bless you, God. Like I went over his head to his boss or something. You know, what the hell do I know, you know? I was four years, I was four years sober when I went back to sea. I traveled the world sober. Made meetings wherever I could. Tried to stop meetings wherever I could. I came back, and with the help of the people, I had left school at 15. And with the help of the people in the program, I uh, took the entrance exam at Fordham University. I, sure. And they accepted me. And working the tunnels day and going to school at night, fully matriculated, I graduated with a degree in fine art in five years. You know? I left the tunnels in 88 with black lung and retired, doing my own thing. I've uh, been sick recently. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to wind up by saying the most important statement I could possibly make up here, aside from the fact that I have not picked up a drink today, is this. Thanks to you and this magnificent program, slowly but surely, I'm becoming the person I dreamt to be. Slowly but surely, I'm seeing, I'm hearing, I'm feeling, I'm doing all the things that I drank to do. Slowly but surely, I'm becoming me. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's one reason I drank, it was because it gave me the feeling of me. And the irony of it all is by not drinking and listening to you, you have given me the reality of me. Thank you for me, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.